All right, y'all. Thanks for joining us, John J. Thursday, last day of November, 2023, November 30th. And so, Gary, um, the recording, so I kind of do this on an ad hoc basis. So it depends on the content. Sometimes I keep the content only to the video membership. Sometimes part of it goes there. Sometimes I cut it up and I put parts of it on YouTube. And um, I've started using Bright Brighteon, sometimes on Rumble, but mostly Brighteon and YouTube recently. Um, so lately I've been cutting up the videos and just putting parts there. So you can just check that. I try to tell you what I'm going to do next. If I put something on the private area, I, I'm going to probably send the link to the telegram channel. That way, whoever was, is paying attention can watch the video and it's not public. So sometimes I do that. Sorry if it's, you know, random, but I'm just trying to put the content where I think it should go. Um, so let me know if you guys have a better idea. <laughs> No, it's, it's good. I, I figured it, it'd kind of be that way because I saw what you do recently is chopping them up. So I was like, he's probably doing that. What I like to do is listen yeah. to them all, on my drive to work and stuff like that. And, you know. Okay. You you just hear the audio? Right, okay. right. I rip that's them and then way. convert them. Like an audio book. That's a good idea. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, so I want to just mention a, a, a list of uh, cases. So so um, let me just... Let me just, I guess I never have a list of what I'm going to do first, but so I always mention aceofcoins.com. If you guys are new to this, aceofcoins.com is my home website. Uh, we have a service. It's an accounting service. I set that up just because I'm tired of trying to qualify accountants. Uh, so these guys are out of the country. They could care less what the IRS says. They will never testify against you. They cannot be subpoenaed. They cannot be summoned. They do great accounting. They knew they are experts at U.S. tax law. They keep track of all the IRS circulars. Uh, they're, I believe they're in Pakistan. And it's cryptoaccounting.com is the website. I uh, hear sometimes it's a little difficult to get a, a hold of them, but they will do the job. They'll do a very good job. Crypticaccounting.com. Um, then we have privacyfight.io. And we can mention the other one. We'll do that soon. But privacyfight.io is the video membership. You can check that out. And then um, let me just go into, well, before I do that, let me just talk about, so in January, we're going to put together another conference. This time it's going to be in Dallas. And it's going to be really two days, I think. And so the first day is going to have a different ticket. It's going to be $97. This is tentative now. $97 for the Friday. It's going to be a full day, eight hours. And then Saturday, I'm going to call the workshop where we can actually do some more technical things and learning and hands-on and things of that nature. That's going to be closer to $500. Okay. So you guys can decide. I'm going to put up the entire presentation so you can decide what works for you, make comments on it, but we're about, what, I think six weeks. Yeah, six weeks out from that. Yeah, six weeks out from that. So I think that's plenty of time to organize it. So that's what we're looking at. I'm going to say, again, it's tentative. So that looks like January 19th and the 20th. That's a Friday and a Saturday. Okay, and it's going to be in Dallas, and it's in Carrollton. And I'll give you the name of the hotel. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, I'm not going to, it doesn't matter anyways. But anyways, that's what it's going to be. So I wanted to uh, talk about a few uh, cases. Okay, so recently you understand that I've been uh, working on, let's call it new divorce cases or divorce cases with the uh, with certain legal concepts, basically trying to get the court or trying to divest the court from getting involved in the marriage or getting involved in the divorce. That's what I'm really trying to do. That's why I have that series called Divorcing the State. So what I'm trying to do is end that whole drama and put the power back into the family and let them work it out. So as it turns out, we have a list of cases, and there's three of them that I want to mention. So what I did is, in this one case, this the wife wanted to divorce. So she paid an attorney to start a divorce proceeding against the husband. And so he called me, and we were talking about the case. And I wrote a letter uh, telling the attorney to return the money because it wasn't authorized. And I also had the client stop payment on the money. Okay, So we got the money back. But I also sent the letter. And the reason why I sent the letter is because I explained why the, the attorney cannot be allowed to intrude upon this relationship in the manner in which most attorneys do. Divorce attorneys think it's okay because they've been doing it. They watch TV like everybody else. And they think, yeah, that's how we do things today. And actually, that is not how we should be doing things. And there's a jurisdictional problem with the court. So I sent this letter. It's only a one pager. And this, I think, excluded that attorney. I think that killed the divorce proceeding. So now the wife is having to work it out with the husband and they're still, you know, at odds, but I think they can work it out. So I, I'm not going to say that's a complete success, but what I was able to do with this letter was explain the legal aspects of what the divorce involves 
And the responsibility for this, any disputes in the marriage, fall on the people in the marriage, not bringing in strangers to come and intrude upon the marriage. And what they want to do is split up property, assets, and what I call chattels, things in the household, okay? So we, we want that to stop because the status quo actually needs to be preserved. And the court's job is to preserve the status quo. And instead, what family court does is disrupt the status quo and destroy everything. Okay. Now, so in that letter, there was another client I'm working with and his wife did a similar thing. And so I shared that letter with him, not the client's name, but I gave him the body of the letter and he understood the concept. Now he signed up for my course, uh, Divorce in the State, and he watched everything, binge watched all the videos. And I think that allowed him to have a, an intelligent communication uh, con conversation with his wife. And he and I, I didn't hear from him. You know, I figure if I don't hear from somebody, it's because their problem is solved or they're dead, right? <laughs> Since this guy wasn't dead, he, so I texted him a message and I said, "Hey, what's going on? Everything all right?" And he said he wrote back. And he goes, "Yeah, it's great. The wife isn't going to file divorce, and we want to work it out." And I told her there's going to need to be some changes. <laughs> so he was really happy about the whole thing. So it looks like that's led to brought him back to where that's where it should be in the marriage. Okay, solve it. You don't bring in the strangers. You don't bring in the court. You don't bring in the police power of the state. Okay, we're adults. We're not supposed to be doing something like that. If there's abuse or neglect, okay, we got the police power. Fine, but not just because the husband and wife can't work something out, or somebody wants to leave. Okay, if one one spouse wants to leave, then go ahead, leave. You know, no one's stopping that person from leaving. Now, the other case, uh, the third one, similar. This was a child custody case. There's no official marriage. However, I treat these all like husband wife marriages. This one is a girlfriend boyfriend, but they were kind of estranged, okay? But they have a child together and the child's only eight months old or something. And she wanted to take him out of the country. And so she he didn't want to, but because she didn't like that he didn't agree with her, she decided to go get some strangers and gang up on him. That is get a, an attorney to file a petition for child custody and bring in the court and the police power and all this stuff and then risk taking the child because that's what the state wants to do. So I filed a motion to dismiss in that case, and it shut the whole case down. No, no one's responded. No one's objected. No one set a hearing. It's just stopped. Everything stopped. So I'm not saying that's a win, really, but it's just showing you that this is making the, the normal players in this whole divorce family court nonsense step back and think about it. Okay. Now, as it turns out, I do actually have a developed brief for divorce cases, meaning that if there's a divorce I don't care what stage it's in, beginning, just beginning, end, you're already paying alimony, whatever. This brief explains all the legal points as to why the court does not have jurisdiction. It's probably the first of its kind. Um, and, and I need to develop it further, but I can just tell you guys this. Now, I do a lot of legal research, and lately I've been using artificial intelligence. And thanks to Ray, Ray's really been great about that, showing me a couple of things. So I actually had the artificial intelligence help me develop some of these. You know, Rafe, what you see there is some of that is from the AI answering my questions. Yeah. Right, right, right. It's amazing. It's powerful. It's very powerful. Uh, so anyways, uh, I'm not going to share it with you guys. You got to get my course. Okay. Hopefully you're not in that situation, but it really demonstrates what should be happening in a marriage situation and the court should not be involved. Okay. Now, here's an interesting thing. The court should not be involved in divorce, but divorce, I mean, a marriage involves uh, a contract. But it's not really a contract between two parties, but let's just say that it is. So it's a contract. The court, I would argue, may have jurisdiction over the contract, not divorce. The marriage contract, not divorce. Something to think about. So the other aspect is, okay, there's another case. Uh, there's two, two other ones. So this one gentleman, it took, this took like eight months. So this guy got gets a letter from the IRS saying he owes $150,000. You know how you, the IRS is like, Yes, you will pay this or else. It doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. And, you know, your appeals process takes it takes forever. And if you go find an attorney, they're not a competent. And then by the time you get the attorney, it's past the time limit. Forget it. It's just not even worth it. So I use their, what do you call it? Like their bureaucracy. They have this bureaucracy now. So I use their bureaucracy and I sent a letter, just one letter. In fact, I think what it is, I, I think I had a conversation with a client. And I told him what kind of letter to write. He wrote the letter. He sent it to me. I looked it over. I made a couple of changes. And he mailed that letter. This is what I like to try to do is show you guys how to do a couple of things. This guy did this, okay? So the IRS sends him a letter back like two months later saying, we're looking at your letter. <laughs> we're investigating your letter. Now, remember, this is $150,000. They're going to wipe him out. So 
it wasn't until like maybe a few weeks ago, maybe it was a couple of weeks ago, he got a letter finally and they said, you're right, we're wrong. You don't owe us $150,000. It's zero now. We fixed it. So it just goes to show you sometimes, you know, all he had to do in this case, it wasn't anything fancy. All he did was just write a letter and he explained the facts and he sent it to the right agency, the right office. It turns out that the office we sent it to was actually like, like an appeals division of the office he was working in. So it just worked out that way. But it took him like six months to finally get it right. Um, now, this is not really, these aren't really cases. I mean, these are situations, let's call them. But the other one, uh, the, the last one I'll explain here is, so I was talking to a client the other day and he said, he, he got my course in, in 2018. He wanted to be a crypto investor. So he used the LLC, he understand, he, he learned how that works, okay? so. He took my documents and created a whole new LLC uh, on his own. He didn't even call me, which is great. This is what I want you guys to do. And he did it for a different purpose. He was running a business with it. And he had to open a new bank account. So he goes to Bank of America. Remember, he, remember, he took my same documents, okay? This is way back in 2018. He did this this year for the second company. So he goes to Bank of America. I think he walked in there. And the woman at the was opening the account, she was giving him a hard time about the ownership and how he had it structured. And he showed her the BSA, Bank Secrecy Act, memorandum that I have in my banking abstract documents. You guys are maybe familiar with this. And he, he actually didn't just show her the documents. He actually explained them to her. He had read them and understood them. And he explained them to her. And she was so surprised that he actually read the Bank Secrecy Act. And she said, wow, no one ever reads the law. And he said, well, I do. And I understand it. And this is all you're required to do. I don't have to do all these other things you're asking me to do. And she said, you know, you're right. I'm sorry. And opened up the account. So, and he's telling everybody, you know, just, just follow the instructions that, that I give you because they work. The reason why they work is because they, they've been, I've made mistakes, right? So I try to do something and it doesn't work for a client. So I work through it, right? And I find out what the solution is and I publish that. And so when you see my 20 page read me first file, don't think I just made that up. This evolved over many years of making mistakes, okay? So we fixed it. It's not so much mistakes as it is the banking system changing to want more information. So anyways, that's that's what I just wanted to share with you. So sometimes it works out that way. I've had weird situations with Bank of America, especially. But in any case, so uh, that's really what I, want, what I want to cover. And uh, I wanted to open up with Q&A questions. Uh, does anybody want to... There are some things I could talk about, but I just thought I'd break here and see if anybody has any questions. No? Okay. All right. Yeah, thank you, uh, Big Dog. Courtyard Dallas. Where'd you get that from? It just, I did put a page up on my website. I just didn't. I didn't. I published it. I guess you found it there, huh? Oh, yeah, that's it. That is exactly right. It's on uh, Rayford. Uh, not yeah, Railford, right. but yeah, thank you. It's on Rayford, um, Rayford Road in Texas. Uh, Carrollton, Texas. Anyways, I'll give you guys more information as we as we uh, go. Yeah, uh, uh, I don't know if I want to take crypto. I did it. I did it for a while. We got so much crypto, and then I I don't want to. I don't want to deal with crypto. I'm sorry. Just uh, stick with the cash. Uh, you should. You should think I should take crypto. Yeah, you should. All right, all right. Jim you says I should. It. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, maybe I should. All right. Yeah. Well, well, we'll come up with something. We'll just talk about that. Maybe you That's have. Fun. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah, and 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 Elizabeth, you're right. So the whole idea is to divest, wrench away, okay, this whole marriage thing with the court, because this is heavy-handed. And yeah, um, the reason why I would recommend a mediator or a counselor with a marriage or a dispute in marriage is uh, because that person understands how the laws actually work in fairness. So it's good to have that person. I wouldn't go to a mediator or arbitrator to tell them what what he wants us to do with, you know, like property rights and things of that nature, but understand that the marriage relationship is a settled matter where the resources in that union have been allocated already to take care for everyone. So we want to keep that as much as possible close to what it was and don't let a stranger come in there and start just wreck it because he thinks that there's a better situation. But yeah, a mediator could be useful. Same with a counselor. Gary, what did you want to, what did you want to ask? Say. Um, I talk about the fence and stuff again. I, I I know earlier you were saying you're going to go over. The, I guess you redone the letter, but I was yeah. I've been thinking about it and um, 
my my homework is to to read it and tailor it and then submit it. But my thought was to send it as um, what do they call it with the mail we have to sign for a hand signature certified sure. mail. Sure. Um, I didn't know if that would basically trigger the government to respond or if they didn't respond since it was certified, then that means they have basically absolved or given up their right to take action against you. I don't know about that. Uh, maybe the purpose of that letter would be to an exhaust administrative of remedy if you want to sue them. Uh, the letter is after the fact. They've already established the rulemaking. They already had public debate on it. We've already passed that time. So that's why that's why I did the video. This is your next step. So I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll mention something about the chat GPT in just a second, too. There's another thing I want to share with you guys. And uh, Michael, I think you were going to ask something. Gary has his hand up again. <laughs> what happened there? Oh, well, I, was I had actually forgotten to uh, draw it. So sorry. OK, yeah, no problem. Michael. Oh, I just I just was asking about FinCEN, but I, I think you addressed I that. I definitely going to. Yeah, I'm going to cover that next week. I'm sorry. I didn't really have time this week, but I want to give you guys something. The reason why I do some of these things like letters is so you have a you have an, a written understanding of what I think are the most important points. Like, for example, the, the reg says we're going to prevent money laundering. OK, first of all, the, the guys like you and me that are worth under three million dollars and we're opening up an account to trade with Coinbase or something. Really? Really, KYC for a company that's going to have a net worth of under one hundred thousand dollars in most cases that that's so important. It's going to prevent money laundering. And if you are going to prevent money laundering or drug trafficking or whatever, why haven't you succeeded yet? You've been saying that since the late seventies. So, why do I have to give up rights to privacy just because I want I'm going to pay a tax for indemnification? And now I have to give up all this information so that you can use it against me later if I'm a suspect in your crime that's never going to happen. You know, so that's kind of the theme of, of how I was suggesting. But I'll give you guys a letter. Okay. I'm not sure what remedies we have. But again, it's just it's just KYC at another choke point. Kind of getting sick of it. So, all right. Um, I'll share with you on the, and the AI. So I what, what am I using on AI? Let me just share with you if I can find. I, I still have it up on my computer. And I just want to show you. So um, I had a client who he needed to, he needed, it's a unique situation. So I'm not saying everybody should let's all do this. In his situation, it serves his interest to sue a law firm and a debt collector for whatever they're doing in violation of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Just works out that way. So <clears throat> I already have this pleading. I've been using it for years. I just don't have it, the latest version of it. So what I did was I went to chat GPT. And I don't know if I have it here. I'm not sure if this is the right one, but let me just send you the link. I'm just going to post this link in the chat window here. I don't know if everybody should see, everybody should get this. All right. So what I'm going to post here is my current page on, on the AI. So I just go there and have a conversation with it. So I go to the chat GPT and I said, I need a pleading for a complaint for violations of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act for unfair and deceptive collection practices. That's what I told the AI. And it came back with the exact pleading I needed. Now, this is what's important about this. So many times we all talk about what the law is and how we think they broke the law and this sort of thing. And then we don't know how to go get a remedy, how to ask the court for a remedy. And I'm going to tell you right now, here's how it works. Someone could have broken the law. And there's a certain way to explain how someone broke the law to the court. And this is called a pleading. In the pleading, you have to say certain things. It's very sometimes complicated. So you have to allege certain things. If you don't, the court cannot take your case. That's why so many times if you don't do your research and, and homework, so to speak, the court will dismiss your case and you'll think, ah, it's not fair. The whole court's corrupt. No, it's because you didn't say it correctly. Unfortunately, that's just how our system works. So you need to know the pleading requirements or the pleading elements of a complaint. So if you want to sue somebody for violations of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, you have to allege that the collection practice was unfair and deceptive. That's one of the things you have to say. All right. So when I went to the AI, I said, tell me what the pleading requirements are for a complaint for FDCP violations. And it did. It was perfect. It gave me everything. All I have to do now is put in the names and the facts of the case. Maybe I'll make a little, you know, a little more comments in there. But other than that, 
I'm ready to file, get a case number, and serve it with a summons and a complaint on a copy of the complaint on the uh, defendant, which is the law firm. All right. So I just want to share that with you guys. This is a really good tool. Um, I think in the very near future, what I may be able to do is take much of my work and upload it to the AI and then ask it questions about my work. It's like, you guys asked me to write you a letter. If I have 15 examples of that situation, you just have to ask the AI to write the letter. <laughs> right, Ray? Is that how it works? Yes, I had to, I had to unmute. Yeah. And I, and I clicked the link, John, but what it is, is when you log in or me, I logged in my own credentials. It, you know, it says unable to access. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's too, privy. it's too detailed. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's privy to your, uh, okay. Right. So, uh, <laughs> let me just see if I can actually, let me just, um, tell them about the AI where they, it listens to your voice and, uh, it can tell if you're sick. Yeah. That's, I don't know. That's funny. That's just funny. I don't know. I don't know about that. You guys told me about that today. Let uh, me just do this for a, yeah, you could tell you could tell. Uh hold on, I gotta pull it up. Yeah. The AI it, it's it's like fire. I'm telling you guys, it's like fire. We gotta learn how to use it because it's going to be used against us. Let me see if I can find this here. <laughs> ah, here we go. So I was looking up different things for some research I was doing. You guys can see this now, right? So here's my version of Chat GPT. So so like if I go here and I, I got this. Um I'll do it like this. And by the way, when I first did this, I just put FDCPA. I didn't put the whole name. It knew exactly what I was talking about. Uh, It does help to know a little bit about the subject, but anyways. So if I if I tell it, write me a pleading. Here, here you go. You guys are watching. Let's see if it does anything. Write a pleading for. Now sometimes it tells me to look somewhere else because I think there's a filter on here. So. So yeah, basically this is an example of what parts of the pleading are must be included the names of the parties why it has jurisdiction that's title 15 section 1692 the what happened in your case and then you have to say unfair and deceptive and then give copies of letters and then you have to explain what kind of damages you suffered okay and then what to, what you want the court to do about it right and so it's telling you what the this is how you write the complaint now the version i got earlier was was better than this one but anyways you see the idea right so anyways, I'm just going to share that with you. This is a real powerful tool. Um, a, what do you have? What's on your mind? Okay. Hi. Um, so I was wondering what my rights are to decide on a medical decision if I disagree with my ex. Like he right now wants mm -hmm. to get double vaccinated and I'm saying, no, I refuse. I do not consent. Yeah. So, so it, it's equal. 50 50 both parents and they disagree so who has the authority i it's going to have to just be something that's handled privately now if you go to the court the court's going to act as if it has the final word and it will it'll it'll make a ruling based on a set of facts right. so i just suggest that the court not be involved but i don't know it's, this is a hard call because it's a private matter and the private matter is being taken into the court so mm -hmm. um the t one of the attorneys said that the judge will never make the decision. Um, the judge will decide who the parent, who the child will have right. full custody of. Exactly. That's yeah. what's going to happen. Right. Right. So, and, and why should a judge decide that? Exactly. I don't, yeah. yeah. I mean, the judge has stay out of it. So it should be between the parents. Uh, yeah. It, it should be between the parents and unless there's some uh, form of abuse or neglect. Mm hmm. Uh, I really don't think the court has jurisdiction. But yeah, that's what he'll do. He'll assign custody and then go from there. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's it's luck of the draw, I hate to say. Mm -hmm. Unless um, I remove myself from the court system. My thinking is, okay, so if you have a, a controversy like that, uh, if someone's trying to take away custody or they're trying to use the court to take it away, they're going to have to show that you're... Uh, 
unfit or unable to be a good parent. Okay. And to do that, I believe uh, it re requires an evidentiary hearing in some cases. I think it also requires uh, facts to support what the reasoning is behind this allegation. Mm -hmm. So if those facts are presented to the court, sometimes uh, it's important to have an evidentiary hearing and or conduct discovery. Mm -hmm. So if someone says something like in an affidavit and it's unsupported by reports or test results or something like that, I would ask for an evidentiary hearing and ask the other side to prove up such a statement because it's either a statement of fact that belongs in an affidavit or it's an opinion. If it's not supported by facts, it's an opinion and it cannot be relied upon. So I would go on that on that uh, way to challenge those things. So, Okay, thank you so yeah, much. Sure. Uh, who owns AI? See, this is a conversation I was having earlier today. <laughs> I mean, what if, you know, what if AI makes some sort of determination? I mean, what if AI gets information about you and does something with it? Who's accountable to that? And then how to get that information? Putting in and progress. Then, and then, uh, who's that? I don't know. Who's that? Anyways. Anyways. All right. Right. Okay, so I do want to do Q and A. If there's any, if there's any important questions, um, I'm going to give it another 15 minutes. Uh, all right. What did you want to ask? A. Oh, did you already ask me? Is that what you wanted to ask? A. Is that it? I already asked. Yeah. Okay. Super. Okay. And Spencer, what did you want to ask? I'm trying to create a holdings uh, LLC to uh, hold real estate titles. And uh, I'm just trying to wrap my head. I never had to create a holding company. Is this really just a normal LLC? Is it just how you... You could. It's nothing fancy. You just register an LLC in the, in the state where the property is situated. This is your standard way of doing it. And then assign the title to the name of the LLC. Use a quick claim deed. Oh, I thought it was like a special LLC that you got to create. Okay, well, you know, there's some considerations. I mean, I have a, a certain contract the way I write it, but you could just, it's all about titling, okay? Titling establishes liability. Now the question is, what about tax income reporting? So like, for example, if you convey it to an LLC and you understand that part of it, but then you go and sell, or your LLC sells the property and it has capital gains, do you understand what to do with that? Or do you understand about tax deferment? Do you know that an LLC doesn't have to file a tax return? You know, some people don't understand all that. They go to an accountant and they didn't really get a tax benefit from that situation. Yeah, I don't understand it. So yeah. is there anything online that I could look at to wrap my head around it? You're not going to find what I'm going to tell you. I'm sorry to say. It's not like I'm making stuff up, but no one's going to tell you that an LLC does not have to file a tax return. There are plenty of examples of that. Um, is it a pass-through LLC? Yeah. So, yeah. So the way I use it is what people want to learn. This is what I'm showing people. So we, we title property. That's easy. You can set up a company. You don't even need an operating agreement. Just title the comp, title the property. Then when you close on, if you sell it, the LLC gets the, the proceeds and there is a, ta it is income and possibly it's taxable. It is a capital gain, but it's not realized by an entity that has to file, that has to report, that has to pay tax on it because the way the accounting is done on the LLC the tax reporting is not necessary. So the tax, if there is one, is going to be deferred. So that money can go to the LLC and then be spent somewhere else without incurring the tax first. Where do you see that? I don't know. It's in the accounting language. I mean, I can only tell you the accounting language. So the accounting language would be something like uh, the reason why it doesn't have a tax liability is because the money is not settled. It didn't reach its final destination. That's the best way to explain it. It did not create a duty for the United States to reconcile. That's another way to say it. I don't know where you'd and, find that. And also you're saying like with the, once you're closing, you don't really need to create an LLC for the, the property. You could just title it. Yeah, you, you, when you close, you wanna make sure the property is titled in the name of the entity that you wanna have a certain tax treatment. So if you wanna have a different tax treatment than yourself, take it out of your name convey it to the limited liability company or a trust or whatever tax treatment you want to use. An LLC is the easiest way to go. And I could use the PMA LLC for the holding company? It's an LLC. It doesn't okay. matter who owns it. Okay, it's just you. an LLC, yeah. yeah. 
Michael, do you want to add something? Yes. Uh, I recently bought into a business and it was an LLC. Okay. And I bought, I bought the LLC from uh, this, this couple. Uh, I haven't confirmed it yet, but I'm almost, almost positive that they just, they just, with their taxes, they just, they didn't file a separate return for the LLC. It was just a disregarded entity. Yeah. Okay. You could do so it that I way. Bought, when I registered the LLC, when I, I had to, you know, I, I had to change the LLC on the state website and I put it owned by my PMA and I'm a, you know, authorized signatory. So if this one never filed a return, is it still that same status? It never filed a return, but it was filed as a disregarded entity on someone else's return. Uh, your LLC was named as a disregarded entity on someone else's tax return? Well, the LLC had been named as a disregarded entity on someone else's tax return. Then I purchased the LLC from them. I don't know, actually. I've never heard of a scenario like that. I don't okay. know if that is the same thing as creating, uh, filing a tax return. Time will tell. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to say probably not, but time will tell. Uh, okay. I do I do know, and I suspected for many years, that if an LLC that d does not file a tax return, if it did create a 1099 and file it with the government and the pay payee, that that would create a problem just like a tax return would. And sure enough, it did. Someone did that last year. So I knew that for real for the first time, but I, I suspected it would be a problem. So I, so I don't know about this one. I never heard the scenario. With our LLCs, though, they uh, the, our you know PMA owned undivided interest LLCs, it's we never file a 1099 anymore. Yeah, good. That helps. Yeah, don't ever do yeah, a 1099, a, right? Okay. But but I don't know what happens when someone else says it's, it's a disregarded entity. I don't think the IRS cares. Okay. I don't think it matters. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I, I personally don't think it's going to be a problem. So. Okay. I, I got to make a mental note of that one because it's the first time I heard that. <laughs> All yeah, right. that's, a, that's, a, that's been a puzzler for me. Someone else filing a tax return does not, does not establish the tax treatment for your LLC. So I don't think it's a problem. That's why. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go with Jason. What do you want to ask, Jason? Or tell us. There you go. You're unmuted. I think you're unmuted. I can't hear you, though. Yeah, I can hear you now, I think. All right. Uh, Jason, try to connect later. I'm going to go to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, what's going on? Uh, hey. hey, hey. <laughs> um, I just had a very simple question, which might help others if there's participants on here who have not established an L a private LLC with you. But um, one of the steps is to get an EIN. And in the EIN application online, they ask you for an address. And I just kind of put it up there, you know, on the discussion channel. And if you guys were saying, yeah, registered agent or something. Now, my LLC happens to be filed in New Mexico. So I just thought I would put that out to you. Like, okay, what would be the best address? You said just choose an address. Would it be like, you know... The obviously I mean, uh, don't want to do one in California because that's where I am. No, don't do that. But uh, an mm -hmm. address on what form? The the EIN application? The EIN online. Mm -hmm. Use an, an address, like, for example, the principal address of the LLC. Just okay. use the principal address. Okay. That's that's great. Perfect. That's a good rule of thumb to follow, yeah. It, it's irrelevant. Okay. So nobody cares. No one's going to well, send you mail yeah. or anything. Yeah. Well, that's why I wanted to put it out there in case people were listening. They might encounter that, and I've encountered that in... Uh, you don't yeah. want to sit there in a quandary like, oh, God, you know, they don't, I don't want them to write me in California. <laughs> yeah, just, no, yeah, stay out of California. But, man, these guys, will they want to tax everything that moves, even if it, they want to tax until it stops moving. <laughs> oh, my God. It is yeah, crazy. Really. But, I, but I just love the game of it because, you know, it is a game. <laughs> it's like. You know, that's a good attitude because that, that one case, if you look at my video from a couple of years ago, that woman in Oregon and I had an, I had an, a New Mexico LLC. And because we used a PMA as the resident, 
we were able to say whatever we wanted as to the residency of the beneficial owner of the LLC that had the title of the Oregon real estate that she sold. And the title company yeah. was trying to put the tax liability on her, even though it was titled properly. They were wow. still trying to put it on her. And they made up all these forms and they they were wrong. And, and we caught them every step of the way. And I didn't know how it was going to turn out. I was oh just telling God, them. that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And it turned out to where she got 100% of the money and no tax liability and it worked out. So, but she was, nice. she called me and she was crying. And I had never heard that case before. I never saw that situation, but I just worked through, you know, you just go through work. It's kind of a chess game. It is. It yeah. definitely is. And um, so, you know, there's something to that. Some people just want to abandon the whole thing and go, I don't want to do that. I'm going somewhere else. It, sep it separates it people. That's that's your employee versus your business owner. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, you know, yeah. I, I tell people when I tell people about you, I tell them he understands the rules of the game. So you don't have to go try to create some other rules. Just go play them at their game because that's the thing they don't like is, you know, the rules. So, well, if you can do that, I'll do that here. Here's how it yeah. works. Yeah, that's that's what you get like when you get a professional who does a thing like a business broker. He already <laughs> understands what, why he, he's going to tell you something that took him seven years to figure out. That's uh, why. Yeah. So that's what I do. Uh, you don't guys don't have time to learn all this stuff. Remind me to tell you what I something I just did for myself uh, with uh, buying an online business. So I'll share with you. Oh, that. I yeah, for yeah. sure. And the thing I put yeah. in the chair was I just signed up for an AI course, a twenty mo module Good course. Good idea. Good idea. And so yeah, and they've got it down, and it is it is ever changing. But this is this. So uh, yeah, I'll talk to you about that later. But anyway, yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks a little bit. All right, uh, Greg, what you want to say? Hey, John, yeah, I had some follow up on the uh, property and LLC questions. Okay. Um, if you put your properties in an LLC, <clears throat> then you want to sell them. You can obviously sell it from the LLC or you could just sell the LLC. You could either um, way. Correct. So what I'm wondering, like here in Florida, um, we have the annual fee that they like to charge to keep it in good standing. Um, if you let that lapse, Will you have any problem selling the LLC to somebody it depends. else? It depends on the buyer, but it doesn't prejudice the buyer to have an expired company own the property if he wants to buy the company. Because you can always pay the fees. And I think there's a trick to it where if you wait a couple of years, the fees go way down or something like that. But it's, it's not an, a, a, a wrong, it's not an invalid deal if the right. company's expired. Now, someone who, who has an attorney who's doing that will advise him that it is something's wrong with it, but he's lying. And they know better, but just so you know. So if, if I have an expired company and I try to get a lease agreement with the company, the the company the lease company is going to say no. We want a valid company. All right, fine. It's just because of what they want. But it's All it's right. still the court system in our case law sees expired companies as still valid. So the only problem that new owner might have is establishing a bank account or something like that. If they he wouldn't be use... able, to, yeah, he wouldn't be able to. So so what? I mean, you just pay your fees. Um, if, I, if I'm going to raise capital, I'm not going to approach somebody with an expired company. It's just like I'm not going to go to uh, you know, a, a business conference with a no shirt on, right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be appropriate for what I'm trying to do, but just understand that an expired company is perfectly valid. Would it make more sense to maybe use an out-of-state LLC? What, whatever works. Uh, it's just going to accomplish the deal in the same way. Okay. Yeah. Or I guess the other other thing is you could set up bank accounts um, ahead of time and sell them both the LLC and the bank accounts. You could do that. Um, and then just turn over credentials. You could do that way. Sure. You could, the only thing is uh, the other party raising the money, right? Because it's easy to raise money to buy real estate, but it's hard to buy money, uh, raise money to buy shares in an LLC that owns real estate. So it depends on who your uh, buyer is. Uh, right. My Georgia okay. Capital Company that you guys see on my order form that I've had for like almost 20 years, and it was a Delaware LLC. I called it Georgia Capital. I never renewed the charter for so many years, decades. And just recently, the bank started asking me about that company, and I knew they were going to say it should be in good standing. So I went ahead and I registered it as an original company in Florida just to avoid the drama. Huh. Yeah, same company, same EIN. They're just a different state. So I didn't domesticate it. I just, just set up a new one. So uh, gotcha. like Elizabeth was saying, it's like a chess game. <laughs> and do you prefer LLCs over trust for property ownership? For real estate, I like LLCs, yes. I think they're more secure, yeah. 
Yeah, there's, there's many reasons. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Sure. All right. All right. Polly Ann. Sign your mind. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My sister has um, some significant credit card debt and she's really struggling. She has two full-time jobs and um, she has these companies contacting her saying they'll negotiate with the credit card companies if they pay, if she pays them a monthly sum. I said, do not do it. Right. Um, it's a scam. Right. So right. beyond bankruptcy, what would be her option? Okay. What she has to do is tell them all to stop calling her and send her a letter. Do not discuss. Do not verify your address. Don't. Just say, you guys do your job. I'm disconnecting. Don't call me again because it's telephone harassment. Okay. okay. Don't talk to them. Make them make them send a letter. And once they send a letter, don't pay them. Never pay. Make them sue you if that's the case. What state does she okay. reside in? Where does she live? Um. Well, she's working in Idaho right now. Uh, that's okay. not her permanent. But I mean, for the time being, she's she her two jobs are in Idaho. All so. right. So she's employed in Idaho. Okay. So in Idaho, yeah, they, they can garnish wages, but that's years down the road. Don't pay and. Make yourself uncollectible. Your best deal with creditors and debt collectors is if you do nothing. This is the total opposite of what everyone tells you. Why am I telling you this? Because there's a federal law and a state law and the rules of civil procedure, they all work the same way. If you don't pay creditors, let's say you have 10 creditors and you owe a collective $3 million, okay, and you make $50,000 a year, they can only take 25% of your net income. I don't care if you owe $50 million or $5 million. It doesn't matter. You're still going to end up in the worst case scenario of being garnished for that much. So why would you volunteer to pay and then open up yourself to another garnishment? If you're already going to pay, if you're going to make a deal and pay somebody, another creditor can sue you and garnish your wages. Now you got a garnishment and you're paying. And if you don't pay, you're going to end up with imputed income taxes. It gets really messy and really expensive if you start paying them. So never pay. Make them garnish your paycheck if that's what they're going to do. And all your other property and, and income and money and savings accounts and all that, make sure it's held in trust or an LLC or something out of your estate. So the only thing that's exposed is your wage income. And, and I'd be happy to talk with her. I can go through the whole thing and make it very easy. I can make it very easy for her. Okay, so her her bank account would be exposed. She needs to yeah, put just that move it over to an get an LLC. An, yeah, use an LLC. Right, that's the easiest way to do it. Just just keep that account open for the first year. I like to do that so I look normal, but then put the money you care about, put it into your limited liability company. Even if you're the single member owner, it's still mm -hmm. protected to some extent. You're still okay. So I guess my fear with credit cards is that what happens eventually, because I know like the interest is like, you know, it's like 20 It doesn't matter. The, the dollar amount, you'll never pay them. Anyways, yeah, you'll never like, pay and the debt's going to expire. So it doesn't matter. Who cares how much interest it is? Okay. So when does the debt expire? Uh, it's a statute of limitations. Could be seven years, could be 10 years. Really? Yep. It could be. Um, this does not have to affect you, though. This is what I show everyone. It doesn't matter how much debt you owe for how long, because I show you how to do everything outside of your name. So you can you can get rich if you wanted to and never pay them. They can't touch it. The only thing I can't prevent them from taking is winning the lottery, which you probably wouldn't care about. Um, <laughs> okay. but, but everything else, you know, uh, you just don't pay them. And just organize your affairs so they're out of your name. If someone sued me, for example, if someone sued me today, the question is, ask yourself, if someone were to sue you today, what, how would you respond? In most cases, I would ignore it. They would win. And they would get nothing forever. Mm. Okay. If you can, if you can do that, that, then yeah. yeah. So that, that, and then, so now, now what does that allow me to do? Well, I can ignore that and not be in that drama. I can focus on making money and doing fun things that I like to do and yeah. say, oh, yeah, I got to do them differently, but that's okay. I'm happy to do it that way. But, you know, I'd love to talk with her. I can I go over the ins yeah. and outs of it. Yeah. Okay. And then one more question. If you um, decide to go this route, they sue you, whatever, and then whatever, it becomes uncollectible. Are you done with credit? I mean, can no. how would you ever be able to get credit again? Okay, so to answer A's question and your question, so A's asking, why do they get nothing if they win? Because I'm uncollectible. I don't have anything mm -hmm. they can take in my name. 
I have plenty of money. Right. It's not just not mine. It's not mm -hmm. within the purview of what they're able to take. Now, as far mm -hmm. as credit goes, that's another chess game. So okay. I, I let a credit item settle, meaning they're going to stop reporting after a certain time, but it's going to show up in your file for like, let's say seven to 10 years. So an unpaid credit card uh, account item mm -hmm. is going to be under credit as defaulted, right? That looks bad. It's going to lower right. your score quite a bit. Yeah. So what you do is I'll give you a summary. I'm not, this is not, don't just take me literally here, but here's what you generally do is you pull mm -hmm. your file. You, you remove everything that's old, outdated, inaccurate information. Then you go onto LexisNexis on the internet and you mm -hmm. freeze it. You freeze your credit file with LexisNexis. Mm -hmm. Then you go to Equifax and you dispute that credit item, even though it's accurate and it shows you're in default and it brings your score down, dispute mm -hmm. it. And Equifax will have to validate the account. Now, here's how Equifax validates the account. And this is the fraud of the whole system. LexisNexis is just like Equifax. It's just that we never talk about it. So Equifax makes an inquiry to LexisNexis. LexisNexis has been frozen with regard to your account. So because mm -hmm. that's happened, Equifax cannot validate. Therefore, it okay. must remove the item from your credit. Then your score goes up. Okay. So it's just a game. Now, there's other ways of doing things like that. But anyways, you can fix your credit very easily in the first year or so just by tricks like that. But you can also get things done without good credit. This is what I show people. So we could, again, we could talk about that. Okay, that, very interesting. Okay. Thank you very much. All Thank right, you. Sure. I appreciate All right, thanks it. for the question. All right, Jason, let me try it again. I see your, your camera's partially covered there. What's on your mind? Oh. Technology. All right. We could try sign language. I forget it though. Yeah, Batman, I'd like to know. There's another way to buy suing them in court. You can go to small claims too. There's all kinds of things you can do. But yeah, if you, you know, you could you could tell us, man. That's why we're here. If you have something to say, educate us. Jason, you don't want to, you want to try it, but maybe next time. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, what I'm going to do, guys, is I have to run. Did, did it work? I can hear some noise there. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, there you are. Awesome. Hey. Okay. All right. <laughs> hey, um, I, I, um, I did a, uh, got an LLC from you a couple of years ago. I, I haven't done anything with it. Um, I'm in the middle of buying a, uh, a chiropractor office. And uh, they, they want to go through the SBA and they're asking for tax returns. Yeah. Um, I don't do tax returns, but the banks are wanting to contact the IRS and to verify. Or not, yeah, the banks want to contact the IRS to verify. Yeah. Any, any way to get around that? What you do is you can give them completed tax returns, whether or not you filed. Just go completed tax returns yeah. and on the signature line, just write file copy. And yeah, well, that's, that's what I did. But then you did that. They said, yeah. Okay. So they, they want to so, verify it, though. So then ask them in a written letter, what is what role do you have in confirming whether or not I filed tax returns? And how is that part of the underwriting process? Okay. Because for all you know, I have a different schedule than most people. Maybe I don't file every year. Maybe I file every three years. It's not your damn business. So explain to me how that's part of the underwriting process. That's all, I mean, I can't, I can't think of any other way and accessing if they want access to your tax records and you've already given them your tax returns and they want yeah. access they want to verify what the irs say you don't get to do that i have a right to privacy it's under 26 usc 6103 and i'm not required to waive my right to privacy so that i can qualify for a loan that was usc 26 what uh, 26 usc 6103 this is regarding your tax records and disclosing it to third parties. So you have rights to keep those records within yourself, between yourself and the IRS. The bank doesn't have a right to get them except what you willing to waive. And it's reasonable to give them a copy of a tax return, even mm -hmm. though it shows file copy on there and not give them access under the, like, for example, the transcript request form, the 4506T. Don't give them that because they can go pull your records. You're waiving your rights under 6103, and I would argue that you're not required to waive your rights to privacy just for underwriting purposes. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if they're breaking any laws in doing that, but that's that's what I would tell them. Nice. That helps. Yeah. Okay. So as far as like setting up a business, I, I know you said in the past that to have uh, two businesses or two LLCs, one for the main company and then one for the, the money. Sometimes. Sometimes. What, what it depends on what. Uh, it depends on what his liability is, but yeah, uh, a lot of times for a doctor's office, he's going to have an S corp. And so he keeps the S corp and I do an LLC as a holding company. So yeah, two companies, one files, one doesn't, uh, I just talked to a contractor today and I, I suggested he do the same thing only because he had, there's a propensity for his customer, the type of customer he builds for to sue him. It's a way they use rich people get negotiate. They negotiate better deals. So anyways. So I said, you need two companies, one to run your, your manager operations and money, and the other one to just simply be that company that that rich guy sues. It's just a piece of paper, and he gets nothing. And you don't have to defend it, because he's just suing a piece of paper, and it doesn't drag your brand into court. So yeah, in those cases, I would do two companies. I do that also for the people with, with the marijuana products. I separated the money from the business, so that way if their, their business was raided by the whoever, the, the cash flow is still intact and they can still continue operations with little interruption. So, so set up an S corp and then do an LLC as a holding company. Well, it's, if you already have an S corp, I don't like to recommend S corps for most yeah, of my I, clients. I don't, I don't have an S corp. I, I have an LLC. You could do two LLCs that don't file. Yeah. You could do one that files one that doesn't, you could do an S corp LLC, but I, what I'm doing is I'm separating the risk away from the core company. So what's that risk? Well, if it's a risk of being sued, okay, I'm going to put it over here. If it's a risk where my company has a lot of vehicles, I'm going to move those over here. And then my company with all of money and employees over here. Vehicles way over here. Okay. So, so, so can, yeah. I, can, can I copy my, my uh, old operating agree agreement to the new LLCs? Yeah, yeah. Make your articles the way you need to. And you can just start your new company with the same old operating agreement and then modify as you need to. Okay. All right. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, thanks for the questions. And uh, one last uh, thing I'm going to comment here on is what was the reference? I think you're asking about member managers. The reason why I like member managed LLCs is because non-member managed brings in third parties. And when you're dealing with the banks, it's a nightmare to talk about third party managers. I don't think that I've ever done that. Um, so with that, I'm going to just explain one thing. So, and then I'm going to end the call because I got to run. Uh, Recently, uh, my wife and I, we were looking for uh, just an asset, something to offset our living expenses. And my living expenses are like maybe $6,000 a month. So uh, we bought a 3D printer company that sells 3D printers online. The guy had been around for a couple of years and he nets about $6,000 a month. I think the month that we bought it, this, which is just in November here, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, netted ten thousand dollars so some he did something to make it make more money i don't know what he's doing but we have to kind of we have our same suppliers our same marketing our same advertising he's helping with the transition now i found this listing through flippa.com and we were started talking with the seller and he was asking us to talk to him by skype which is a a warning to, to me it's a cause for caution because that may mean that it's not a legitimate offer he's just trying to get my information and then do some trick right so I, I started thinking, well, I'm not sure if this guy is legitimate. And then next thing I know, uh, Flippa closed his account because of that. So I thought, eh, let me just send the guy an email and find out. So I sent him an email. And as I talked to him more, it just seemed like, okay, he's not that smart. <laughs> he just did something that like you and I would do. Just, okay, well, we didn't think too much about it, about it. So anyways, we ended up closing on the deal. So what we did was we opened up an account at escrow.com. It was only $2,500. We put the $2,500 there. The money stayed in escrow. He's been working with us up until today, I think, to transfer the domain and to access all the credentials over so that my wife can manage that. And she had my actually my son help her do that. I kind of stood away from it. I just supervised it a little bit. So now we have a company that sells 3D printers, which is good technology. I like that technology, but we're also making about $6,000 net per month on this thing. And it's probably going to take us maybe, I don't know, 15 minutes a day to manage this thing. So if you just stick with something, you know, at first I thought it was a scam. I said, let's stick with it. It turned out to be, we got lucky. I think it was a good deal. You know, it's making twice what we paid for it the first month. So look around, Flip is one of them. It's a listing service. Look around, there's gotta be more out there. Um, every day, there's gotta be several dozen of those opportunities that cost you under $10,000. And in many cases, you can get the seller to finance it for you for just a few months. Shouldn't be a problem. 
So just, I just want to encourage you guys to just do that. Look at what your living expenses are. Maybe you want a bigger house. Well, if you could come up with a company like that, that offset your mortgage, wouldn't it be easier to qualify for the mortgage and pay off your house and, or not pay off the house, just make the payments, right? I mean, if, if I had a mortgage payment, I wouldn't have a mortgage payment, would I? As long as I had that website. So, yeah, sometimes the listings of flip are not good. So you kind of you have to use your own discernment, you know. I mean, the the, the measuring the measurement I used for this company was that it was the asking price was half of what it was making for one month. I thought that was pretty outrageous. In fact, it's almost unbelievable. But the more I looked at it, the more I realized, okay, that's a real deal. That's a real deal based on the numbers. So you just gotta you gotta look. It's a numbers game. But anyways, I'll leave you guys with that. I've got to run. Um, hey there, Lane. I didn't forget hey. about you. <laughs> no, it's okay. No questions today. All right. All right. You guys have a nice weekend. Thank you. See you, you soon. Too. Bye. Thanks. Bye.